Good morning. I hope uh, everyone had a great evening yesterday, could grab a coffee on the way this morning. Uh, so the, today I expect uh, this to be more a discussion and be a bit lighter in terms of technical content uh, than uh, the one I gave yesterday, uh, which was about uh, uh, per CPU memory allocator uh, in user space. Uh, but we may even have some time to touch base on that other content if you guys still have questions after having digested that content. Okay, so uh, my name is Mathieu Desnoyers. Uh, I'm CEO at uh, Efficios, and I maintain uh, some pieces in the Linux kernel, namely uh, the restartable sequence system call, uh, as well as the membarrier system call. I am also maintainer of uh, the tracers of the LTTNG project uh, and of the user space or CU library and the libarsec project. Uh, okay, that being said, uh, today's presentation uh, is about integrating libarsec or perhaps pieces of libarsec if needed, as needed, uh, into the GNU-C library. And I want to discuss with you, well, both the technical challenges that come with it, the process challenge that may come with that if we need to copy uh, one code base into another and keep them in sync, and also uh, discuss what would be, I would say, the initial targets for prototyping improvements to figure out if it's worth while to spend our time doing that. So the goals, so how can GNU libc leverage the RSEC system call? Uh, and I mean, that could be by re-implementing its support entirely or taking pieces of librsec, which aims at facilitating using RSEC, especially the critical sections uh, from C code. So it features inline assembly for about six or seven architectures. Uh, so we're talking about uh, about 10 plus function, uh, inline assembly function times the number of architecture. Uh, so we're at about 60 or 70 inline assembly functions that would have to be kind of redone, rewritten uh, for those six, seven architectures in total. So what is RSEC? So this, this slide is really stolen from last year's presentation. No new content in there. So it's a system call that was uh, added into Linux 4.18. Uh, it uh, basically user space registers a per thread area at C startup thread creation. Uh, it allows user space to create small sequences of code or transactions uh, that are managed by the kernel. Uh, so it by no means use any kind of hardware support. It's really just mitigated by the kernel um, scheduler. Uh, it allows fast access to per CPU data in user space, and it is used. Uh, it can be used by well, it is used by GNU-C uh, library uh, since 235 to speed up get get CPU because. As we will see, as part of RSEC, so RSEC, yes, is a me mechanism to allow fast per CPU data transaction, but it also exposes some fields uh, uh, to user space. So they are basically memory mapped both in the kernel and user space. So the kernel, well, the kernel always has access to the user space mapping, but the kernel knows that when return to user space, it needs to update some values when they have changed. So user space always observe current values. So we currently have the CPU ID, but I, I, as I will show soon, now we have the Numa node ID that, that's available uh, since uh, Linux 6.3. Uh, we also now have the uh, concurrency ID, so, and we can extend that. Some ideas I've discussed with Florian, I mean, exposing uh, the current, the, the PID, the thread ID. The, this is all information that the kernel could put there so that user space just has to read this information at a given offset from the thread pointer, and they have that information available, always current. So some use cases uh, for use of RSEC, resource allocation, ring buffers, counters, synchronization in general. So as I mentioned, the facilities currently exposed by the RSEC system call CPU ID, Numa node ID are available, so user space can read them with a simple load. The concurrency ID, uh, I won't go into the details, I did other presentations about this, but this is, you can see it as a per CPU index, which is, allocated by the kernel based on the number of concurrently running threads. And this is 
basically allocated so it, it stays as close to zero as possible on the system. Um, so it has uh, interesting benefits if you run, for instance, processes within a container that, uh, that is constrained with CPU sets. So if you have a large machine and then you have a container constrained by CPU sets and just use four or five CPUs on your huge machine, then the concurrency ID are going to allocate or use indexes that are really close to zero. So zero, one, two, three, four, let's say. So this brings interesting memory savings. Uh, compared to allocating data structure for every CPU you happen to run on on that machine. So, um, or, or you may run on the, the worst possible case, right? Uh, so, uh, and it also uh, performs synchronization of the RSEC critical sections. So the critical sections, uh, I won't go in details there, but they, uh, they are started by user space by storing a simple pointer to a field in this per thread area. Uh, and then they, it's, you can have a sequence of loads, compare, branch, then you uh, complete with your side effect, a store instruction. And basically, if the kernel preempts, migrate, or delivers a signal on top of your critical section, it is going to move the instruction pointer to a abort handler that is defined in the critical section descriptor. So you basically either complete with your side effect or you abort, and you either retry or have a fault back mechanism. So with that, you can actually implement uh, per CPU data access with simple loads and stores, non-atomically, in a way that basically will handle migration if you end up being migrated between reading your current CPU number and having the side effect. So the current stages of RSEC in the GNUSI library. So starting from 2.35, and I think it was backported to 2.34 in RHEL. Uh, so there's registration of the per thread RSEC ABI. And uh, RSEC is used uh, within the implementation of SCED get CPU to accelerate it. And it was mainly useful on ARM64, uh, where a VDSO was not available to get the current CPU number. Um, and turns out it's actually faster than a VDSO. VDSO involves a function call, uh, sometimes some code uh, as well. So in this case, it's just a load of a per thread uh, value. Um, so there is work in progress to support extensible RSEC area. Uh, uh, so uh, Michael Janson is leading uh, this uh, effort and we are having good feedback from uh, Florian. We had feedback from DJ as well, so thank you. Uh, so this will be required soon. Uh, as soon as we extend RSEC fields beyond 32 bytes, uh, we need that. Otherwise, we won't be able, we won't have the, the memory allocated in user space to use those bytes. So we are, work is ongoing there. Uh, so now about librsec. So this is a library that I started uh, working on. There's been no release yet, so it's just a master branch at the moment. So no, don't expect uh, stable APIs for now. Uh, but things are converging. Uh, so it consists of a per architecture a set of header files, uh, and they, they basically contain, base, let's say you have a basic atomic operation similar to a compare and exchange. So you want to have a per CPU compare and exchange that's implemented in a faster way than something that would use a atomic operation and log prefix. <clears throat> so we provide this kind of helper in line assembly function. Uh, there are a set of different functions because you can do basically arbitrary functions in there in inline assembly. So it can be comparing two vari variable testing and then doing the store if it matches some conditions. So there's a set of, uh, of API functions available. Uh, if we have time, I, I can go in more details into which, uh, how, how that API looks, looks like. <clears throat> that would be interesting, I think. Uh, there's a per CPU memory allocator that I presented yesterday uh, that I, cre I created uh, within the last year. So uh, after discussing with Florian, the use case for GNU libc would probably be that, well, GNU libc knows beforehand the entire layout of the per CPU data it needs. So what I would expect is that, I mean, you don't need a full-fledged memory allocator for the libc needs. 
Maybe some ideas of what I've done in that allocator would be useful, but you don't never need to free memory. You don't need to allocate many pieces of per CPU data. You basically could define a single structure saying, well, this is the per CPU data that the GNU Lipsy needs. And then within that structure, you could embed substructure per subsystem. Oh, the memory allocator needs that. Uh, this, uh, this thread cache needs, needs that. These are the... the statistics counters. So, so you could basically do a static layout and do a single allocation, and you, you'd be good to go. Uh, the only thing is, what, what varies on the system is the number of CPUs you need to populate and such. So for that, there are some tricks I did in the uh, uh, mempool allocator that would be useful there, but perhaps not the, the part where we dynamically allocate memory. Maybe not, not so much. Um, so, there's also in LibRSec uh, implementation of some common per CPU data structure test code where uh, as needed, I can lift that out into public APIs. So for instance, uh, per CPU spin locks, uh, per CPU uh, link list, queues, uh, ring buffers. Uh, so there are various basic data structures that are implemented there for testing purposes that we could easily lift out into uh, public APIs. And those, uh, those could be useful directly uh, from a new libc point of view in some specific use cases. Um, some ideas on how the new libc could leverage libarsec. Um, so, speeding up get CPU. So get CPU not, uh, does not only load the current CPU number, it also needs to have access to the current node ID. And this is really, uh, this really requires doing two loads from the RSEC critical, uh, the RSEC ABI region in the per thread storage. So those two loads could be made atomic from a migration perspective or preemption perspective by doing those two loads within a RSEC critical section and retrying it if, uh, if there's been preemption. So uh, that would be one use case of both, well, the RSEC CPU ID, node ID, and the RSEC critical sections to make sure those are loaded atomically. So that could replace the get CPU implementation in Libsy and make it faster. Uh, as we discussed last year, uh, file pointer locking, uh, and I even did a prototype. Uh, I don't know if you recall Florian, so I sent you that prototype after we, we've discussed. So the idea is many of file pointer use are actually single threaded, even if they are done within a multi-threaded application. I mean, you create the file pointer, you uh, use it, uh, read from it, store to it, and then you're, you close it. So it's really, it's a single threaded use. So currently the libc, as far as I know, basically as soon as the application becomes multi-threaded, then you apply locking to everything. So it's a big switch. In this case, I, uh, the prototype I did allows using RSEC to basically make sure that you can transition from an initial state, which is single user, to a multi-user state that will provide locking and everything in such a way that you are guaranteed that there are no single user code still accessing the data structure when you flat flip mode. So uh, that should work pretty well, and I would expect it will give a good performance improvement uh, in, the, in this use case where you have single-threaded file pointer users as a common case, but you are within a, a multi-threaded application. Um, other use cases, uh, memory allocator free lists or arenas. Um, the idea there is with the concurrency ID concept, you get a hint from the scheduler about the number of threads that are running concurrently uh, for your given process. So with that information, you, uh, you could directly scale the number of arenas you allocate from. You don't have to guess. You don't have to say, oh, it's eight. <laughs> uh, so if, if you run on a... a let's say on a process that has two thread or limits itself with scheduler affinity or use CPU set to bound itself to just a few cores, then you get up to that max bound of arenas. But if you scale to up to a much larger set of uh, cores, 
with more threads, then the number of arenas would grow as it is being uh, indexed. So that's, uh, that would be, I think, one good target. Uh, resource allocation, statistics counters, synchronization. So synchronization, uh, the file pointer locking would be a good example of, I think, uh, where RSEC could help uh, for synchronization. Um, statistics counter is another one where, so typically you have a choice between keeping your statistics counter uh, within per thread, uh, variables, and then you have to kind of sum them up. You, can, you have to set them up when the thread is created, or zero them at least. Uh, or you have a global variable where you have cache line bouncing whenever you increment it, even if it's done atomically. So doing those statistics counter with per CPU or per con concurrency ID variables really allow you to have excellent uh, cache locality, no false sharing, and then if you uh, need to query them infrequently, you just sum them up. So split, co split counter approach. This is uh, uh, really straightforward. <clears throat> okay, so just a few notes about the last year's presentation. So I, I did discuss also uh, how it could be used or either LibRSEC, either RSEC or RCU, how those tech, uh, strategies could be used to improve some of the locks we find in the GNU Libc. Uh, so I detailed quite a few strategies last year. I won't go back into the details here, but there were some some very heavily, I suspect heavily used locks that could be replaced with much lighter weight strategy, where you, in the typical case, you would not even need locking because you would have always a current copy available available, accessible, and that then you only need, let's say, for things that are changed infrequently, like the time zone, you might want to provide mutual exclusion on the, on the updates, but not necessarily on every read access. Uh, and I'm not even talking about reader write or lock here. I'm talking about having multiple copies and using something like RSEC or RCU to ba basically synchronize the, uh, the swap versus the readers. So I think there are gains to, to get there. There are some ideas I have in my, had in mind for quite a while, so it's not clear exactly what it would look like, but I think RSEC could also be useful to do a kind of fast version of signal blocking. So currently, if you want to block signals, you basically have to call the kernel and tell it, okay, let's block this mask of signal and then let's restore. So with RSEC, one thing we could do is to actually, as we extend RSEC, we could put a kind of fast signal blocking mask within the RSEC area. So user space would start to store to it, telling the kernel, okay, please block this mask of signals. So what it would require from the kernel is to basically, when it wants to deliver a signal, check that user space mask, that's first, so it's, but it's okay, it's not a fast path. Then, if a signal would happen to need to be delivered when this mask is being blocked, then what we could do is let the kernel store into that user space area a, a, a flag that says, well, user space need to handle signals soon or query the kernel soon. So whenever user space exits the signal disabled critical section, what it could do is, so it restores the mask, but it checks as well this flag. If this flag is set, it means the kernel wanted to deliver a signal during that critical, critical section, so user, user space could call a system call that would get, it, get its signal delivered. So that would be one approach. Um, so I'm really open to discussion on this, uh, but I suspect, I mean, if you have some short uh, region of code where it is very important to, to block signals, but the overhead of calling the kernel twice is too much, that would allow you to block and unblock with simple loads and stores and checks. No calling the kernel if there's no signal to be delivered. So, and it is not unlike mechanism that I've seen within the Linux kernel. On some architectures, you can either, so on some architectures, you let, uh, tell the CPU to disable interrupts, but on, uh, I think it's PowerPC, they have this soft interrupt disable, where they let the, the hardware deliver the interrupt, but they gate it 
by software by, with, with a flag. So the interrupt handler checks that flag and says, well, okay, so the, the, the kernel does not want the interrupt to be delivered r right now. So that, uh, in, in those ways, when uh, interrupt disabling is very expensive in hardware, that's a trick that, that is used to uh, make it faster. So similar concept, but ported to user space for signal. Okay, integration approaches. Uh, I don't expect LibRSec to become uh, uh, used as a dependency of glibc. I think uh, glibc would be much better off to be uh, its own standalone library, uh, as I think is the direction it's uh, going now. Uh, the alternative would be to copy some pieces of LibRSec into the GNU libc. Uh, it's MIT code, so it should not be a problem. Uh, however, it, it opens up question uh, regarding how to keep the trees in sync, whether there are prerequisites on the librsec code base. I mean, do we need to change our coding style? Do we, can, but can, I mean, yeah, all those things. Uh, and also the build system approaches for our specific implementation is really different between GNU libc and librsec. So in librsec, we basically use uh, Processor defines that tells us which architecture we are built on, which uh, decide which arc specific code we need to go and include. Uh, in the GNU libc, as I understand it, it it's really more about include uh, paths uh, search, and then you can override with arc specific code and so on. So it's really different. So. Uh, it would uh, remain to be seen whether we can integrate our approach for the RSEC header or if we need to adapt the port uh, to the uh, build system approach that is taken within GNU libc. Uh, but that, of course, would happen only if we figure out, yes, there are improvements that the, the, the RSEC approach can bring to uh, GNU libc data structures. Um, so here's a link to the V12 of the RFC for extensible ABI. That's a link to the LibRSec project. We have time for questions, comments, and if we have time left, I can even show you uh, the current header file. We have the, the, the helper API static inlines that we have in LibRSec, just to give you an idea of uh, what it can provide. So time for a question. Apologies if this is a naive question. Um, you were saying that um, when you stop blocking interrupts, that, that you'd get a, there would be a user space flag word saying these were the interrupts that the kernel wanted to deliver. Oh, we're talking about signal in this case. S sorry, signals. Yes. Wouldn't, wouldn't at the time you, you stop blocking, wouldn't they be delivered immediately? So you wouldn't, that information, by the time you read that information, it's going to be out of date. So when you unblock, so your question is about unblocking this yes. mask, right? Okay. So first of all, you want unblocking operation to be simple stores from user space for performance reasons. Then the, <coughs> sorry. So as those are simple stores from user space, the kernel is not aware immediately of this unblocking, right? So that's why you want to have an extra field where the kernel stores to it and user space samples that field and figure out, oh yeah, the kernel wanted to deliver a, a signal during this uh, signal of critical section, so I need to call the kernel. And give the kernel a chance to deliver the signal. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, over there. So about uh, the macros for generating the RSEC critical section. Yes. Um, to be honest, I would like to see support for that in GCC directly so that people can write code using function, yeah, regular function syntax. I'd and be then, happy to see that as well. <laughs> if anyone has the time to start working on that. Yeah. And then use attribute flatten to to put everything into one code sequence because with the kind of approach I'm worried that if something goes wrong, GCC puts something in the code section or something like that, and then it's no longer contiguous 
in the text segment and then the RSEC critical section stops working probably and we might need not even notice that because it requires uh, preemption. In oh, you mean a, for testing? So I guess, okay, so, so testing coverage, I think, is one of your concern here. No, it's making sure that the, I, I think the, the, the preprocessor and inline assembly stuff is slightly abusing uh, <laughs> what you should be doing writing C code. Or, I mean, it works and it's great, but I don't really expect it to be robust in terms of future compiler changes. So your concern is about using static inlines uh, or, or ASM, inline static, ASM? Static inlines, inline ASM and preprocessor to just model the con uh, to generate the contents of the RSEC critical section. And yeah, then okay. assuming that GCC will keep it in a one single code block so that you can um, turn it into an RSEC critical section that's communicated to the kernel. And I don't think there's any explicit guarantee that GCC will provide that kind of behavior in the future. So, okay, so your concern is that you don't expect GCC to keep inline ASM as a single block of code? Or, so you, you, you are concerned that GCC could spill C code into inline ASM? Uh, do you generate one ASM, inline ASM statement per critical section? Yes. Ah, I didn't know that. Yes. So it's just, uh, then that it's just about limiting functionality because you don't have functions or loops using nice syntax. Uh, sorry, it's just a... Um, you've got, you don't have... Um, you don't have full C syntax available. No, no. That is, no. So it's per your, architecture assembly. Yeah, okay, yes. okay, I see now. Thank yes. You. Okay, so the, the advantage of integrating into GCC would be that you can have a more familiar programming environment. Yeah, those would be built-ins, I guess. Yeah, or, or function uh, attribute flatten and then certain rules for, uh, so there's, a, there's an existing attribute that tries to inline as much as possible because it's already needed for other applications? Yeah, actually, there, there are a couple of approaches there. Uh, one would be to transform the basic, uh, let's say, compare and exchange alike basic stuff that I did to make that a built-in. That would be one approach. Another approach that would be more flexible, and I, I think, as far as I recall, some people are at Google are actually writing C code, kind of looking at the compiler output and making sure, oh yeah, doesn't seem like the compiler is doing bad things there, so let's consider that a RSEC critical section. So they, they're taking chances there based on compiler optimizations. So it might be also use, uh, interesting to look into uh, telling the compiler not to bleed code within a given function because that function or that static inline consists of a RSEC critical section. And it's important that nothing, I mean, the compiler is not aware otherwise of the fact that the kernel can abort at any point. So if the compiler optimizations try to interleave other code with it, we're done, right? So, so having some ways to annotate the code, telling the compiler, uh, I mean, be aware that semantically the kernel can branch out of that, from that code at any point. That's something that would be useful because then I could replace the, this entire mess of yeah, that, per architecture assembly I, by C. That was I meant, what I meant with GCC integration. That would be nice. Yeah. I'd love to see that. Yeah. But of course, yeah, I don't think anyone is working on it. Carlos. Why aren't we working on it? I mean, like, there's, there's honestly, like, a bunch of, like, I mean, and this was uh, maybe Steven's comments earlier in the talk yesterday, which is, like, we need things from the compiler, too. Like, we'd love to have, like, uh, so name symbol versioning in the compiler properly. I think HJ's had a, something open for that. Um, I remember, like, long ago, Joseph, you'll laugh, remember when we used to use the, like, um, function attribute interrupt when we were implementing some of the 32-bit ARM pieces where like you want to write an interrupt handler for an RTOS 
And when you're writing in code, you want that interrupt handler to be written in C, but you want the, the thing that it generates to have no function calls because it, it technically is an interrupt handler. And all it can do is load and store memory. And this just feels so similar. I was looking right yep. now at attribute interrupt on the GCC docs to see how much we did. Yeah, and it, on ARMv7 targets, the interrupt type is ignored, and the attribute means the function may be called with word align stack pointers. There's like a couple other options here, but I feel like that's very similar. I, and I agree, it would be fantastic to be able to write these and see, because they're going to be, they're going to get rough if we have to implement really big ones for malloc or other, other constructs within glibc. So I think it kind of means we might have to do some compiler work. I mean, some of us are also, also work on compilers. I, and it should be possible. So, um, but having said that, at the same time, it doesn't stop us from starting some integration process with these macros. If they're single inline ASM statements, GCC today won't touch them. Yeah. So I don't, I don't think it stops us. It's just like we're thinking ahead what will yep. be the next steps. Um, yeah, for me, I think malloc is the biggest single like high value use case for this. Um, yeah, do you want to show the code? Like, what are some of the macros you've got that are useful here? Like, if we still have time, I'd love to see them, and I'd love to just get your your comments on like which ones you think are the most useful yep. and why. Is it? Oh, nobody can see anything. What? Yes, it's coming. Yeah. So I'll have to kind of turn around because it's not mirrored on my own screen, but let's do okay. it. Uh, I, actually, I think I will try to mirror it. If you give me a second, otherwise it's going to be tricky. Um, displays, mirror. Yeah, it works. Um, yes, oh, it was this one. All right. I'll start actually with the pseudocode <coughs> because I did copiously, uh, well, I, Michael and I, we copiously uh, documented each of those uh, uh, inline ASM helpers. Uh, with the pseudocode, so it's architecture agnostic. We can have a clear picture of what it does, and then we have deeper architecture gory details. So, uh, pseudocode convention, Rx, register X, we have a tag for variable, label, then we have loading, storing, compare not equal, compare equal, add and mem copy. So, and <clears throat> this convention happens to give the name to the inline ASM uh, identifiers. So, for instance, the first one we have below, so it's a RSEC load, compare branch, not equal, store. So it's basically doing, if we look at the pseudocode, it's loading a value into a register, it's comparing that register to some expected value, and then there's a, you put the label, label where you want to jump if it's not equal, and then you store. So that's, that implements basically a load comparison store. So that would be kind of, that's one of the, and I, then I can show the data structures we have on top and I can show how they are being used. Um, the, the one question I have is, um, do you ever envision the fact that you'd have um, a, another CPU writing to data and you have to atomically access the data within a restartable sequence or would you just never want to do that? Yes, uh, so we have use cases where... And I, like I know you'd want, it, you'd want it to be per CPU and you wouldn't, like you'd want to design the algorithm such a way that you're storing the per CPU yes. uh, data, but like what if you had to touch something where there's yep. something outside of a... Yep. Uh, our set critical section, but yet it's accessing the memory. We in actually a have that data have free way. Yes, exactly. Yes, 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 okay. yes, yes. So here, so with a, with your memory ordering requirement. Yeah, memory ordering. So we have actually the ability to say, okay, the store that is at the end should be done with a relay semantic, so that 
another CPU can come and poke at that information with an acquire semantic, and it can be used for synchronization of a ring buffer, for instance, or yes, so this is part of it. But we were just talking about the helper functions, and what I'm saying is during the entire block of the critical section, what if you needed to do a uh, relaxed demo load because you want to possibly observe something about a sequence of threads that's going on over here and you want to observe it in your critical section. Yes, yes, I have, there are use cases for that and I have prototype branches implementing that. Um, let's see. But it would, I mean, it's just, it, it does, is, I was just wondering if there's a helper for that because it just turns into, from an assembly perspective, it turns into the required, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Florian says, can we focus on the basics first? Okay, let's go back and keep yeah. looking at the thing. But, but, but so, so in, I don't recall the use case, but there was a use case for using a lock compare and exchange within our critical section for some reason, I don't recall which, but I mean, so you, you can use our sec as a mechanism to make sure you're not preempted in everything uh, while you are touching global data as well. Yes. So it's also, it can be used for that. Yes. Um, okay, so let's go back to the, uh, sorry, pseudo code. So you were asking which ones are, so, so those were actually created as we created the RSEC test cases. Uh, some of those are uh, per CPU spin locks, others are per CPU linked lists and stuff like that. So you can see, so load add store is another one. Load add store is actually an increment of a given value. Uh, load compare, uh, compare and branch if equal, store add load store. So that was more useful if you needed to basically go and fetch some information later in a structure. Uh, so, I mean, I won't go in each of those, but let's have a look at the use of, of this in the test case. Oh. Uh, param test is a good one. Okay, how I test my critical sections. That's actually an interesting point. So one thing that was mentioned is, how can you make sure it works if the race windows are so short, right? So what I do, I inject delay loops within my assembly. So every intermediate step within the assembly code, if it's compiled in that way. So production code will never have that. It's way too slow. But in test, stress test code, what I do, I inject delay loops, which are really spinning for a num number of loops, in between each step within each uh, inline assembly helper. And what I do in my test code is I make each of those race window much longer, and it's configurable, so one execution will have this race window longer, another execution this other race window longer. So to make sure that I hit the cases where it gets preempted during the critical section at that point, and how does the abort react? Is it in a state where it's, it's going to break up everything or it can recover? So this is actually tested in the test cases. So it takes a lot of CPU time, but it works. Um, okay, back to the test cases. Okay, so we have a per CPU lock. Uh, so it's taking a lock on the current CPU we are on. So you basically say, okay, you pass a per CPU lock structure and you say lock this CPU, the current one. And it returns the CPU number that was the one that was locked. So typically you are still on that CPU. You may have been migrated from that point because you are back to C. You are not in the RSEC critical section when you return, but you have taken a per CPU spin lock at that point. Then unlocking is just storing a zero to that variable with a relay sem semantic. So if you have per CPU data structure, oh, thank you. Thanks. The top one? Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, so you unlock with the release semantic, uh, and uh, so that gives you a pretty cheap uh, spin lock for per CPU data. Uh, so that's the boilerplate code. 
The next test case is just testing counter increments. So per CPU counter increments, uh, and then we sum up the total. We make sure that every increment has been seen. So that's a, so it's a, the load add store, which relax semantic. And all of the RSEC critical sections are in the uh, RSEC underscore blob. Yes. Right. So there, for example, there it's ret equals RSEC load CBNE store pointer, and then you pass in all the parameters that are required for your block. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, and this one would be a list per CPU list. That's that. That would be the push. Uh, that basically do, does the load compare not equal store to push into the list. That would be the And all of these are also infinite loops because those are the conditions where the critical section failed and you have to retry, right? Like all these have RSEC likely not ret, right? Yes, exactly. If and it you, fails, yeah. You have to do something and then retry the critical section. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. That's, uh, so to just get Nick's question in the comments. So Nick is asking a question about what are the forward progress guarantees yep. of the critical yep. section and whether you would have infinite loops in production code yep. versus infinite loops in test code. Yeah, I have entire talks on that topic, by the way. Very good question. Uh, okay, so there are cases where Okay, because I intend to use RSEC for ring buffers in LTT and GUST. Uh, when the, all the underlying pieces will be there and deployed in our uh, customer systems, I want to use it. And basically, making sure we provide forward progress warranties while using RSEC will require us to have, okay, let's think of a, the simple use case of having a per CPU counter. So you want to increment this per CPU counter with RSEC, but what do you do if it fails, right? So the approach for per CPU counter is actually an interesting trick, which is to, so to turn every per CPU counter into an actual split counter, where you have one counter incremented by RSEC and a separate counter incremented with a log prefix atomic instruction, that is your counter slow path. So if RSEC fails, you go to your slow path and increment the other counter. So you can sum all of those counters and you get your total split counter. So that's one trick that gives you forward progress, but you get the gain of having RSEC in the fast path. So I, I try to have similar, tr similar tricks for my entire ring buffer algorithms, actually. So, I mean, that basically means you are relying on the slow path to provide the forward progress guarantees with the uh, CPU atomic instructions, yep. which themselves have, I, like, I don't even know, do the CPUs even, <laughs> do they even offer forward progress guarantees? I think they probably do. Uh, uh, Most for instance, CPUs. Intel, yes. Yeah. Uh, if you have LLSE based, not necessarily, but this is Correct. a general yeah. problem that architectures have. For sure, yeah. That makes total sense. Yeah. So, so sometimes it can be trickier. The more complex the data structure, you have to think a bit more, and you may have to reserve an extra data structure for your slow path, just to, if you care about forward progress, if it fails, you might want to say, okay, so I have something per CPU, but in case the per CPU case fails, I have this extra structure on the side that's slower, that handles the slow path. That also works. So partitioning works quite well for that, but you need to design with that in mind. Does it answer your question? Thank you. Uh, okay, so list pop, that's another one. That would be list, uh, which one? CPU list, buffer push. Uh, so that would be having a ring buffer of stuff you push and then you bump a counter that says what has been pushed. So you can then consume it on the other end with a buffer pop. Uh, that's another one that was implemented. And all those could be migrated out of test cases into actual APIs uh, for, for larger use. Uh, that's the buffer. A mem copy buffer. Oh, yeah. So the first one, that's a buffer that has a pointer to data. And then you push the, the, the value about how many of those pointers can be consumed. The other one, 
is doing a mem copy of the data in place into the ring bufferer and in, uh, changing the, the counter of how much data can be consumed. So because we are within a, our secretical section, we can implement an entire mem copy operation in line within the assembly of the RSEC and be aborted if the memcopy needs to be aborted if we are preempted. So we can basically atomically, from the point of view of preemption, do the entire memcopy and increment the counter of how much data was pushed or be aborted while it happens. So the actual side effect we really care about in that algorithm is the increment of the counter of how much data was pushed. If we're aborted middle of memcopy, well, that's garbage data that will be overwritten anyway the next time another push comes in at the same location and overwrites that data. So it's a don't care. So there are, uh, like that, so there are side effects uh, that, well, you don't really care about that atomic, uh, uh, algorithmically until the actual commit is done, and that's fine. So that's one way to use, use RSEC. So push and pop for the buffer, the mem copy buffer. And I think that was the last one. Yeah. Can you show the structure of the minus ID section? Good idea. Let's take X86. Uh, so I don't think the code is there. I think it's, yes, uh, no, that's the. Helper code, x86 bits, bits, yeah. All right, load compare, branch not equal, store. Okay, there we go. Um, so we define a table. Um, this is defining a table in a given section uh, where we have a reference to the label uh, so we have the start, commit, and abort pointers. Um, then we have definition of the exit points. The exit points are only meant to be consumed by debuggers. Because think about how you would single step over code that contains an RSA critical section. As you have a breakpoint in an RSA critical section, you are always preempting. So what is going to happen is you will always abort. So, uh, so you end up with a forever loop if you do not have a forward guarantee fallback. Yes. So, uh, <clears throat> so one way to let GDB or other debuggers handle critical, those critical sections is to make them aware of those exit points and entry points. So they can basically skip over the whole RSEC critical sections. So that, that's why I've placed in uh, each of those uh, inline assembly description of the entry points and each exit point of the crit critical section. So a debugger can step to the entry point, then put breakpoint at each associated exit points, uh, and then basically continue up to the exit point. So you don't get to single step the actual critical section, but at least you get to step over it. And that can be useful if you do uh, instruction per instruction uh, single stepping. Uh, okay, so that's where we actually begin the RSEC critical section. We store a pointer to the beginning, to the table, actually, sorry the table we've defined, we store a pointer to it to the RSEC area, RSEC CS field. So it's a single store that begins the critical section. Then uh, here we are actually comparing the current CPU ID with the one that was read from the C code in user space because you can have preparation steps in C where you load information from the per CPU data and then you hand over the CPU ID that was read and then we can compare it within the critical section. So we basically abort if it's a mismatch. Uh, we, well, we jump out if it's a mismatch, sorry. So, uh, so here the injector ASM, this is just for testing. So in production, it's a no-op. In testing, I insert delay loops in there, busy loops, to uh, make sure we test being preempted at that point. So that's a comparison of the expected value with the value, jump if not equal. 
Uh, here I also have, this is test code, comparing twice. So we never expect that comparison to fail. If it does, then it's a bug. So, uh, we, so that's, uh, that's also test code that's compiled out in production. Uh, and then the final store, so it's storing the, this uh, new value to value. Uh, and this is the after final commit instruction label. Uh, which is uh, uh, 2f, that's the commit, after commit. Uh, and then we define the abort handler. So that abort handler has label 4, uh, and it's basically just jumping to a abort label in C. So we are using ASM Gutu. So from the assembly, we can jump to the abort handler. So we actually have different labels. So we can jump to abort, which, re re which returns minus one. If not equal, return one. Then we have our error labels for testing purposes where we really uh, abort the application. Uh, but just in testing, of course. So that's the basic shape of uh, what the boiler, boiler plate uh, of uh, RSEC critical sections look like in assembly. Yes? Assembly like this assembly for maybe the list push and pop functions so that we can see how much instructions of course on those macros. That would be nice. <laughs> no problem. Uh, param test. Uh, dot o. All right. Signal handler. Let's do the spin lock. Uh, the debug code. Actually, you know what I'll do. Just one second. Let's modify param test and. For just readability purposes, let's do it like this. This CPU lock is becoming attribute no inline. And let's do the same for the unlock. So that should make things clearer. The CPU lock, CPU start, inject, read. Okay, inject C is outside of the assembler. I think I have, uh, uh, let's see. Read once, inject, or do, let's do it even better. No inline on the RSEC, so arch xcd6 bits.h attribute no inline, and then we'll have a look at this guy. It did warn. Let's see if it still works. Um, yeah, it does. Okay. Uh, let's see. Compare, store, test. Well, the thing is, okay, that's why it's ugly. Uh, the injection. Okay, yeah. Um, Param test benchmark. That one will not have the actual param test.o. 
Yes, that's better. Yes, okay. So I removed. So, so what was making the, the, the assembly much, much larger is those delay loops, which are inlined into the assembly. And they actually each check a given static variable to see the, the number of loops they need to do. Okay, that's better. Um, yes, that's what I expect. Exactly, yes. So we're doing a MOV, uh, so I have to recall exactly what it does. I think you should uh, disassemble with dash R so that you get the locations. OBG dump dash R. Dash R is in Roger, small R. Like this? Yep. Thank you. Oh, that's better. Ah, yes. So I have to guess. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> good, good, good. Thank you. So that one is loading the RSEC offset to use it to offset from the, uh, is it FS on XCD664, the, the thread pointer? Um, so we're then doing this LEA, uh, which is really giving us um, load effective address. So we, we basically want to get to the RSEC area and then store the content of RAX to this RSEC area in a specific field, that would be setting up the RSEC CS value, telling the kernel we are starting the critical section. Then we're doing the comparison of this other field, which is, as I recall, the CPU ID that we want to compare to make sure that whatever CPU ID we receive as input is equal to what is present, so that's the comparison we, de, uh, we do about the CPU ID. <clears throat> uh, there, RDI with RSI. So that's a compare and branch, so what I expect here is that whatever we're, RDI, where RDI is it? RDI is the first argument to the function. Yes, okay. So, yeah, okay, so we have a pointer to a value that has been given to us, yes. And we compare that with the expected value, right. Uh, if uh, not equal, we jump out. And then we do this final store. So we store to RDI again, so that was the input uh, pointer, and we store the new value to the input pointer. And that's that store, yeah. So that's, that's what the assembly looks like. It's surprisingly tight, I agree. So there's just this extra right to set up the CS um, as RSEC CS uh, pointer, and then you don't even reset it after exit. Exactly. And <laughs> this is possible because if the kernel preempts you outside of the code region that is described by the RSEC CS descriptor pointed to by the pointer, the kernel is going to take care of doing the unregister. The only case where you need to explicitly unregister setting that back to zero uh, or null is if you intend to DL close the code that contains the descriptor, then the kernel could go and read garbage. So for that case, you actually need to store it back to null. But otherwise, you just leave it, leave it in. Okay. Or you could just, on library unload, you could just always clear that, and you'd be good for, for everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.